Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, we'll now open the floor um, for questions from the audience. Um, so when you ask a question, please uh, briefly, very briefly introduce yourself. And um, please, please, as much as possible, try to put your comments in the form of a question and a short one so that we can allow as many people to ask questions. So we'll start with a couple of questions and then I'll turn to see if we have any questions online. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Kathy Wotecki. I'm a professor at Iowa State University and former chief scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and undersecretary for research and education. And my question is to Lynette and to Derek, and it is the essentially the research framework that we need to put into place to carry out what is this really excellent uh, conceptual framework for improving um, the food systems uh, around the world. So as I was uh, reading through the report and, and listening to the presentation this morning, um, the main thing that I see as a next step in a, a new partnership with the research community is we need the development of evidence-based policy tools. Uh, we need the development of analytical tools. We need a library of analyses. We need countries to adopt open data policies so that nutrition and food policy researchers can have access to program data as well as research data for, that is being sponsored within those countries. We need a whole series of studies of sufficient size, power, uh, appropriate designs to, to answer some really fundamental questions that are, that are posed in this report. And so my question is, uh, can IFRI play a role in this, um, in helping to catalyze the research partnerships, the analytical tools, developing a library that can be made available? And if not IFPRI, what organization should we turn to? So um, please, if you want to answer the question, go ahead. And um, if other members of the panel, you want to also chime in, please do not hesitate to do so. And please speak into the microphone. Thank you. I'll just start with, with something related to the framework. And then, and then I think that if pre question, pass that over. Um, I think the, the food supply, the food environment, and consumer behavior structure that they've laid out in the report is already giving us the, the primary clue to the framework for research. We have to understand both from the consumer demand side, what are the drivers and the barriers and all of the limitations around, around motivating consumers to demand better foods, but also their interaction and, and their points of interaction and their constraints with the food environment being their points of purchase and so on, and, and then the interaction there with the, with the broader food system. And I think there is some research that is starting to happen around each of those points that are that is highly relevant to the challenge that are laid out here. But we're not going nearly far enough in, in understanding the way we interact with our food environment, the way the, f the, the companies, whether they be multinationals, which are, which are highlighted more but, uh, um, in the report than, than, in, than some of the other industry that are providers. In low and middle income countries, it's often not the large companies that people are procuring their foods from, but it's the small and medium sized enterprises. So how do, we, how do we bring that in and how do we work better with them? So I would encourage us to, to as researchers, to build on that already as a framework. Um, it, it, I think it lays out all of the, 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 all the way from the policy through the implementation and through the creating demand and so on. Um, and then I'll pass that over to Ifri, if you wanna. Yeah, though I think you're absolutely right. Um, even just um, you know, measuring and monitoring diet seems extraordinarily difficult. Um, you know, diets, unlike many other things we're interested in, are, are very much an individual thing, um, and it's just so complex to, to measure those. So we need, you know, improvements on um, dietary measurements. Um, there are projects out there looking at that, Index, for example, um, and, you know, things like time constraints and so on as well, we don't really monitor very well. I think we also, I think one of my perceptions is that um, there's a lot of re research that's fairly micro, zooming in on, you know, particular 
food environments, looking at supermarkets, uh, you know, looking at schooling issues and so on. I think there's not enough um, economy-wide um, analysis. Um, Will Martin, who's sitting right behind you, is, is now you know, starting some work on that. Um, but getting economists to understand sort of food systems change at a macro level um, is, is really critical. And I think another research gap um, is this issue of rising obesity rates in the developing world. Um, donors, uh, you know, Western donors, multilateral agencies are still very much focused on undernutrition, and that's understandable. Um, but there's a big gap, and and most of, and the economic benefits to preventing rising obesity must be huge. Um, but we're not really funding that, so that's another serious gap. Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough to have worked with Kathy Wojtacki in the Clinton administration, so we uh, go way back on a discussion of framework for research, and I, I actually see progress. Um, and I, I'd like to piggyback on something, uh, Lynette, you said. I wrote down specifically, you said sometimes in our policy recommendations the evidence is weak or absent. I agree with that. And the, the challenge when we were developing this report is uh, when is evidence enough, or when do you have an inkling that this idea might actually have high potential for improving nutrition. And I think there um, we have to bite the bullet and say, okay, let's, te let's us test it out vis-a-vis -vis maybe policy experiments or policy research. And I'll just give one example, um, some work that I did with colleagues at Tufts um, that was uh, shepherded by the um, uh, National Governors Association, so bipartisan Republicans, Democrats, at the point we did it, was chaired by Governor, Governor Huck Huckabee, a Republican from um, Arkansas, and we were looking at the issue of green stamps giving purchasing power, a higher value in food stamps, when it was still food stamps, to purchase fruits and vegetables, tested it out, it was evaluated, not by us, by another group, and showed that indeed purchases of fruits and vegetables increased, so you're in essence making those products cheaper at the margin. Now that has a price tag to it. Uh, in the United States, we can afford to pay for it. But I think we need other kinds of um, uh, ideas to test out in developing countries where the government funding of some of these initiatives would be sorely lacking. So that's one point, and I think a part of the, and I don't think we've done this as well, a part of developing this research framework, I think, by definition, must involve policy officials who define what is what information is it that they need, what the re, not what simply the researcher wants to do, but what is needed. And I say this because, um, in, in so many of what I received when I was uh, in USDA in technical areas, reports great, but when my question was, well, what's next? There was often stunned silence, and I want to give a little heads up to USAID, who on this one has bitten the bullet and actually under um, Feed the Future, including some of the work that uh, uh, funds me, is actually putting a strong emphasis on what I call operational research and implementation research. We know what the nature of the problem is. Now we're trying to find out various approaches, various strategies, which work and which are most cost effective. Yeah, I mean, I think the research agenda question is is really an important one. I think there are a lot of stakeholders who are trying to create large databases. Tufts has the global dietary database. Godan is the global open data. What is it? for agriculture nutrition? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of these. There's a lot of indices are trying to be formed, but one of the issues is just this dearth of data. So so. To have an index, you need good data underneath it. And so I think we call out in the other report that I am the co-chair on, the Global Nutrition Report, of just there's just big holes in, in data sets. Um, we obviously have the, the burden of disease, the Global Burden of Disease Project that has tons of data at its, at its, its uh, disposal. But I think, you know, one issue in research in the way academic institutions, I don't know if IFPRI's like this, but in academic institutions, it's not a sharing culture, you know, to each his own, publish or perish. It's the way the whole institution of academia is set up doesn't really allow for that open sharing. And that's something that needs to be a complete shift in, in the way we do research in a more collaborative way. But until processes of tenure and promotion stay the way they are, 
it's going to be very hard for top tier research institutions to share their data. The global dietary database is not open access. You have to pay for that data. You have to ask yeah. for permission. You have to have them as co-authors. So it's a real issue in, in, in the institutional structures of research that doesn't really allow for that collaboration. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll take um, three questions and then a fourth question from online if we have one. And then, so please again introduce yourselves uh, and direct your questions. Thank you. So let's start there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Yasser Islam, formerly head of communications with Harvest Plus, independent consultant now. The same month this report came out, the New York Times ran a very long investigative piece in September saying, entitled How Big Business Gets Got Brazil Hooked on Junk Food. And it was a very long article and really detailed how, as growth slows down in the wealthier countries, multinational companies are moving into Latin America, Africa, Asia to grow markets. And a professor at Carlos Monteiro at uh, Sao Paulo, public health professor said, you know, he said it's a war, but one food system has dispro disproportionately, disproportionately more power than the other. So I'd love to hear how we begin to readdress some of that power imbalance because this is a huge driver and I feel often the issue has been skirted in these kind of discussions. We talk about working with private sector, but the power and, and wealth and money behind private food companies, transnational ones, is so huge. So is it a war or is it working together? What's the solution here? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, Ruben Grajeda from the Pan American Health Organization. Uh, last year, in coordination with FAO, we organized uh, at least uh, 14 country co technical country consultations uh, about uh, nutrition and food systems. And also, we organized a regional consultation on this topic. Uh, maybe three of the most important conclusions is uh, where uh, there is a big problem about uh, food, healthy food, availability of healthy food in the countries. Uh, they are expensive, there is difficult to, fi to, to find it. Even in rural areas, we have a, a food deserts. Uh, the food is in the market, in the municipality, uh, but uh, there is impossible to find a healthy food in the highlands or in other parts of the countries. Uh, prices is another issue, uh, they are expensive. Uh, Junk food is easy to find whatever you are in the highlands or whatever you are. It's very, very easy to find a Coca-Cola or a snack, very cheap uh, in these countries. Uh, the other thing, uh, we need to uh, work to regulate or to find a balance between the food industry and what we have in the food industry regulate the marketing, regulate the uh, food labels, whatever, uh, because uh, they are the food, the food industry is uh, regulating what we eat. Uh, then uh, we need to look for this. Uh, PAHO and FAO are working, we are working together uh, to implement uh, soda taxes, to implement, um, to regulate the uh, food marketing and also to introduce a, a food label. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. My name is Akila Vasan. I'm with the GMA Science and Education Foundation. So my question is mainly, I mean, a lot of markets around the world are moving from the traditional or the mixed more, they're tending towards the modern. The but, I mean, in the U.S., we have a lot more people are trying to buy local and they're trying to go, go to the farms and buy more food. But So there's a lot of movement ongoing right now. But in most cases in developing countries, it's moving more, shifts more towards the modern. So what is the role, I guess, of industry in this dialogue? How do we get industry to be a part of this dialogue? Because we want industry to be accountable. And how, I mean, is there already a way, and which I'm not aware of, or is there some way in which we can have industry be a part of the dialogue? So we'll take one more question here, and then a question from online, and then the uh, panelists can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suresh Babu from IFPRI. Um, almost about 15 years ago, 
uh, IFPRI started to think along the food systems approach. And at that time, the reaction was it is too early to think about and the departments and the universities and the institutions and the ministries are not ready to come together from the food systems perspective. It came about because of we started thinking about in the 80s farming systems research, you mentioned that. And we then started thinking about integrated uh, food systems in the context of nutrition as well. How do you bring aquaculture, livestock, and, and crop production together at the community level, farm community level, to make nutrition impact? But then it kind of died off, partly because what, what you mentioned, Jessica, the, the, the uh, difficulty of bringing scientists together to work. And I think we are still facing that, uh, except for a few institutions like Tufts. I mean, there is no nutrition policy kind of uh, program. Uh, widely, you know, taught, bringing economists or public policy people with nutritionists to study. Cornell used to do that, but then they kind of went back to the traditional clinical nutrition. There is some element of that still there. Uh, but the real challenge in the developing countries is the, the capacity, capacity to bring people together. And we keep talking about that in every seminar, and we go home without doing much about it. I, I really want to push the panelists on what is missing. Right now we are, we are working with the FAO uh, on operationalizing this food system framework. We are finding it very difficult to bring the ministries together. We talk about multi-sectoral approach, but bring them all together in one room and talk about nutrition with limited knowledge about nutrition. It's a major challenge if you want to operationalize. But I want to uh, just get your opinion about how do we go about getting this multi-sectoral capacity on the ground. And one last question from online. Yes, yeah, one of our online viewers asks about the complexity of the pathway to impact for nu pathway to impact for nutrition outcomes, and questions whether there are any really good examples of success that have brought together economic, environmental, educational, and food system determinants of malnutrition. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll start with some of them. Um, I love that you recommended the, or mentioned the uh, Brazil New York Times article. I don't know if any of you have read the whole series. It's called Planet Fat. It's not exactly a great title, but anyway. Um, and, and it gets to a bit of the issue of what you were bringing up of this. Uh, who's supplying the food system? With what? How? And you know, why are we seeing this imbalance? And most people point their finger to industry, and we have as Lynette brought to light the multinationals, and then we have lots of small and medium enterprises and the more informal food markets. And I think this is the biggest issue that we're dealing with. I mean, who owns the food system right now? Who owns it? Who's controlling it? And if we can't answer that, then how can you hold anyone accountable for behaving in a bad way? So who, who should control it? No one? And that, to me, this is a big question. Should governments control the food system? Does that mean that they, you know, top-down heavy regulation? Uh, this, these are really significant big challenges that we face. But, you know, when we talk a lot about the role of industry, uh, the food and beverage industry, we should also mention beverages, um, but we also have to remember that demand can really shape supply. It's not all supply shaping demand. I mean, that definitely is there with trade and subsidies, et cetera. But demand can significantly shape supply. Look at the gluten in the United States, the gluten-free. Everywhere you go now is just at, at uh, Trader Joe's last night. Half the products are gluten-free. And people don't even know if they're gluten intolerant. They just think they are. I mean, this is industry scrambling to reformulate their products around a consumer demand of something that consumers really don't understand completely. But it's completely shifted the way industry's thinking about their foods. Now sugar is the culprit. Industry's trying to reformulate sugar to get it down as low as they can but keep it palatable. So I think we also have to remember how powerful the consumer base can be and that it's not always that you know, we need to regulate supply, but demand, I think, can also be quite 
influential in how we shape the food system. So I think there has to be both. Um, but to me, the, I think that the biggest issue, and I have very few answers, Eileen probably has more and other people, experts on the panel, but this power imbalance and, and how do we hold people accountable and how do you, cre you create incentives for the, the guy who owns the corner store in the rough area of Baltimore to sell only healthy foods, how do you incentivize him from an economic perspective, I find very perplexing of how to do that. Um, and we have a lot of people at Hopkins who work in the food environment, Joel Gittleson, in these very impoverished areas trying to incentivize shop owners to sell healthy foods, but you know, he's often, he's often given the response of just like he has three heads. Like what are you thinking? This is not what our consumer base wants. They want potato chips and soda. So we need to shift both sides, you know, the, the power balance and how governments can engage, but also the consumer base. Yeah. Oh, can I just ask one, one other thing? On, the, um, on the, the, the food systems, I think traditionally we've all been trained on very strict disciplinary type, um, you know, PhDs or masters or bachelors. We very much focus and hone in on one area. We don't a lot of us have not been trained in systems thinking. And there's very few food system advanced degree programs and very few executive training food system programs for ministers to come for a weekend or for a week to get systems thinking training. So we need more of these kind of executive programs, certificates in food system training, multi-coordination of different sectors and disciplines. There's a few that are starting to emerge. Hopkins has a certificate in food systems training. Uh, John Ingram has, has a consortium in England of food systems degrees from different uh, universities. So there's a few of these emerging, but we need to train young people in thinking more about systems. We just traditionally don't do it. Um, yeah, I would say the, uh, to the first question, the analogy is not war, but diplomacy. So I think we, you know, need, uh, tough diplomacy, um, rather than war. I mean, as Jessica mentioned, there are examples, I think, of the food industry making changes, uh, you might say from within, but under, um, external pressure. So as, as I was saying in the closing remarks in my comments, I mean, one of the issues is how can we, um, put more pressure on food companies? Um, ex expose their practices. Um, so we, we need more than the, uh, you know, occasional very good New York Times article. Um, I think on the capacity building, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even reach as high as food systems. I'd say if we could just get basic interdisciplinary training, um, get ag economists to do more training on um, nutrition, basic nutrition. I mean, to give you an example, I mean, working in India, people are still very obsessed with um, just calories uh, or, or just insufficient calories, let alone too much uh, calories. So, um, you know, still not thinking about um, diets more holistically. Um, so there are steps to just to just to get um, nutrition more into agricultural and uh, economics programs and, and mainstream um, economics programs. Uh, the question online, yeah, I very much doubt there are good holistic food system success stories, but as I also mentioned in my comments, I mean, I think there are there, there is op opportunities to look at um, countries or, or even parts of countries that have um, done things well and managed to avoid both both uh, overnutrition and undernutrition. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, we haven't really. Um, discussed the uh, whole issue of motivating forces behind consumer taste. And again, I'm going to anchor it to uh, some of the early work coming out of IFPRI, Pear, Pinsurbanus, and others, Derek Thorbeck at um, Cornell. But at very low levels of income, you see something which was called an inflection point. Very low levels of income. If income increases just a little bit, you see the households uh, can demand more oils, sugars, animal source products. I mean, that, so that's a more variety in the diet. And the reason I raise that is uh, thinking about the role of um, uh, 
the private sector in increasing demand for products that are healthful but also that the consumer wants. Industry responds when there was the whole no fat phase in the United States and you had something called what they call snack wells cookies, which personally, I don't want to offend anybody personally, I thought it tastes like cardboard. But they flew off the shelves initially. Now you don't hear about them anymore. And I think part of that is taste. But um, somebody mentioned food deserts, but no one I don't think has mentioned food swamps which we're seeing particularly in low income areas where you have lots and lots of, of vendors, providers of food, but they're what we would call, I think, unhealthful uh, products that are there. And so when you think about changing consumer demand, I think of different kinds of access, financial aspect, as financial access, which is, can I afford it? Geographical access, is it there? Educational a access, you know, providing the right kind of information and, some of the, the work on the report on labeling, for instance, if people just read the label, their purchase would be better. Well, may or may not. But one thing we haven't talked about, Derek, is um, uh, uh, there's a trade-off between time and money. And some of the products you talked about, like the relatively uh, uh, cheap source of, of calories and protein from eggs, but it requires a certain amount of preparation, whereas some of these off-the-shelf products, no preparation. and when we again at IFPRI, when I was doing a lot of work on effective gender ahead of household on food consumption patterns, uh, what we hear heard loud and clear from the data is that women loved getting away from production of coarse grains because of the amount of time involved in in uh, processing and et cetera, et cetera. And so, I think we sometimes romanticize traditional food systems, but we have to look at what parts of this food system we want to keep, what do we want to change, and I'll end with on this round. Uh, in the, the activity Jess and I had in Argentina, from um, questioner after questioner from developing countries, there was a, almost a consistent message, different words, but a consistent message that food systems are changing, and we're naive to think they're not. So we're not, we're not going to stay in this uh, bucket of the traditional food system. They are emerging, migrating to mixed and more what I call industrialized food systems. What is it we do now to put in place changes that we uh, enhance the positives of the traditional, like decreasing traditional malnutrition, stunting, underweight, et cetera, but minimizing the other part, which is negative, the overweight and obesity. And that I really think that points to let's – uh, I hate to say guess, but let's taste, take what looks at high potential approaches, both policy and programmatic, and test them out. And that'll generate evidence, and maybe Lynette, maybe we'll say, well, that didn't work, but at least we'll know. Or if it did, let's try to scale it up. I wanted to make a, a, com a comment on the, on the systems issue. I mean, one is, I think, uh, a lot can be learned from the experience of the health sector and the way that that we've been looking at systems issues and dealing with systems issues uh, more recently. I'd say one of the biggest lessons learned, and this is from a donor perspective, but it, it gets down to the nuts and bolts. It's very hard when you work on improving a system in some way or another to measure your impact. And then people are not so excited about giving you money because it's not as direct as when you work on a specific problem or a specific issue. So this is something that the health sector has not figured out. Anybody else want to give it a try? <laughs> I think we all like to know. The, the other thing that's interesting on the multi-sectoral stuff at the country level is I see more and more countries elevating nutrition above the ministerial level and creating some sort of national office of nutrition, often under the prime minister. What happens, though, in, in my personal experience in a number of African countries, is you get somebody up there who isn't a member of any of these multi-sectoral dis disciplines that feed into the multi-sectoral discussion. You've got the Ministry of Health still tasked with and implementing nutrition-specific activities. You've got the ag folks going, well, yeah, nutrition, but this crop will earn more money. And, and so I, it's a step in the right direction, um, but it is very hard to get people t together. I think it is, it's a big challenge. I think 
you know, um, education will help, but also um, this, if these national offices of nutrition could have stronger convening power, stronger leadership, and that's, that's something we can, we certainly all can help countries to achieve um, to really make that dialogue more fruitful. Um, I want to pick up on, did you want to follow up on that directly? Okay, so there were two things I wanted to pick up on. One is the is the power struggle again. Back to the is it war or is it is it working together? And I think we don't necessarily know what will work, but we know demonizing industry isn't going to work. That's not going to get us where we need to be. Um, so at Gain, we have a p philosophy of not being pro business, but being pro working with business, and that's those are two very very different things. And I think. We, um, we need to be very careful in working with business. We have to have clear policies of engagement. We have to have clear mechanisms for tracking and, and accountability in that policy for engagement. But if we don't engage, we're not going to get anywhere. And I think we do have a few examples of engagement that are you know, maybe not demonstrating an enormous results at this point in time, but are demonstrating progress. One is the Sun Business Network that is jointly convened by um, WFP and GAIN. And there are many companies globally that are members of that and are very willing to work with us to talk about what are some of the approaches that they can use to make themselves more pro-nutrition. Um, and then similarly, that's at the global level, but at the country level as well, there are many national sun business networks now that are working with both large national companies, multinational companies, and, and also small and medium-sized enterprises, and concretely trying to come up with plans and action. Um, and we're working with the sun business network, my team is working with the sun business network to develop a measurement framework and indicators so that we can actually start to track some progress of how um, how we're seeing and how we can start to measure some of the things and the, and the, and the results of that. Um, and and a, just one very quick comment on the multi-sector. I actually wrote down all of the sectors you mentioned in the report, Jess, because um, I see this as one of the biggest challenges that, that um, for actual action in countries. You noted agriculture, health, food industry, trade, environment, energy, water and sanitation, education, and social protection need to work together. In my former life, I was an evaluator of social protection programs in conditional cash transfer programs in Latin America that required collaboration of health, social protection, and education only. Only three of your 10 or so there. Enormous problem and enormous issues to get that, those three sectors to, to dialogue together. Um, and what ultimately helped was the common measurement framework that they had to report on in terms of key performance indicators and, and, and targets that were set by government and that all three of them had to, had, had to be held accountable for and to report towards. Um, but I think that's a big challenge and we need a lot more creative thinking on how to, to motivate and both motivate and, and, um, and oblige, let's say, that coordination across multiple sectors. Okay, go ahead. No, I, if I could follow up on a uh, couple of comments, uh, questions, but also Lynette, your comment about uh, private sector. Uh, where I come out, I guess, is somewhere between out and out war and diplomacy. Somewhere in, the, and I'll use the example of the uh, HLPE, uh, which is one venue, but where they have both a um, a civil society mechanism and a private sector mechanism at the plenary. And let me just say, the civil society representatives come well prepared, know what they want to say, have it written, um, but I don't think we would call their interactions necessarily diplomatic in the way that that is generally. <laughs> and I bring this up because I think that the private sector tends to be a little bit more reserved, and I think, you know, you need each group to have a seat at the table, but I think we need to have a, a, a way of engaging in that we are saying what we honestly think. Everyone is entitled, I believe, and the senator from New York said this years ago, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And if some people throw out, and I'm talking about on all sides, including country delegations, boom, if it in fact based on evidence is incorrect, that's the venue, that's just one venue, 
Sun Network and others for responding to that. And I'll give you an example. This is going to be shock and horror here at IFPRI. But when we were developing this report, uh, there were some, didn't come out in the report, but there were some quite negative comments about biofortification. My gosh, how can anybody be against that, right? Well, there were. And uh, I don't think the team reacted, uh, you know, you're wrong, we're right. It was, well, what's the evidence on that? On what are you basing that opinion? And of course, the report came out quite differently. I'm looking at, you know, anyway. So, but unless you have both the critics and the supporters in a room or on a phone call or on a webinar at the same time, you're going to miss opportunities for the nuances of these conversations. And then I just want to add one comment on the, uh, the multi-sectoral, since we're doing a lot of research on that at the moment. Uh, the rubber meets the road at the local level, whatever that is, village, war rate, or whatever. And I think we haven't done a lot in thinking about the capacities needed at the, uh, uh, at the uh, local level. And again, I'll, I'll throw out an example. Uh, there tends to be sometimes uh, whatever your nutrition sensitive approaches are, let's throw in some behavior uh, communication campaigns. Now let's just throw it in, you know, as a number one, it's cost free and it's going to do some good. Well, do we know that? We'll have, we'll have something coming out. Uh, within the next month or so, uh, where we've looked at SBCC across a range of sectors. And lo and behold, a lot of it is not effective. But where it is effective, wash. And we're laying out reasons why. The messages are very specific. It's very targeted behaviors if you do this. And so targeted behaviors and where those are adopted, they have payoffs to health and nutrition. So, you know, that tells us a lot about the operational part of it. Uh, and I think we need to, again, I used the word before, romanticize a lot of these strategies and look at what's really happening on the ground, either at, at uh, you know, at these um, uh, groups or at household level or individual level. And it's, it's operational research. Okay. Let's open the floor again to questions here, here, and here. Thank you. And please be brief. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Astrid Jakobs, uh, German Embassy. Uh, just one comment, maybe. I think we hear a lot about um, bringing a message over to consumers, to politicians, and so on. I think we all have to gear up on communication skills. I think that just as a comment. The other point is, um, as my country is very engaged in the implementation of the right to food, I was very happy to see in Jessica's presentation that she was mentioning the right to food. It was under the um, heading of obstacles, more or less. No? My question is, is it intended to put it more as a measurement, if it's fulfilled or not? Or can we also see it more as a tool to achieve a better and healthier diet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. This has been a very engaging discussion. My name is Diane DiBernardo, and I'm a nutrition advisor in USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. But my question is actually um, more to do with our issues here in the US, which I think are probably common in other parts of the world. I live in one of the poorest neighborhoods in DC. And I think we need to pay more attention and hold accountable our municipal officials in D.C. I would argue strongly that they're actually a huge part of the problem. In my neighborhood, our city council member and our mayor are both actively preventing any improvements to the neighborhood, including zoning for retail at grocery stores and incentivizing them because they see it as evil gentrification rather than helping low-income people. And I think more needs to be done to address governance at that level. Thank you. Not really a question, sorry. Thank you. <coughs> sorry, Will Martin from, from IFPRI. I'm, I'm a little uneasy about the enthusiasm in the report for the use of trade barriers um, to affect nutrition. We know from economics that the assignment principle, when you have a problem that focuses on consumption, it's usually going to be best to focus on consumption policies um, rather than on trade. Um, and the Pacific Island examples that are given there seem to me very, very weak um, because the trade barriers that were imposed equally 
non-trade barriers, consumption taxes could have been used. There was no domestic industry. So I'm sort of puzzled and I'm wondering you know, why the report came out that way and whether that, that issue was sort of fully debated in the context of formulating the report. So we'll take one last question here. Thanks, uh, Amy Simmons. Congratulations to, uh, to Jess and, and Eileen and their team for putting this together. Um, I wanted to, to return not to the, to the phrase food systems, which I think advances our conversation, but to the, the phrase food environment. Because I think you mentioned it, Jess, the psychosocial part of the food environment and why it is people eat what they eat. And the fact that for everyone in this room, everyone around the world, eating is an important part of the day. And choices that people make to eat are not just because they're gonna be healthier and they're gonna be able to work harder or whatever, but it's because they, it expresses culture, it expresses social relationships, it expresses comfort in some cases. And as we look now at a transforming, a, a transforming definition of malnutrition to include micronutrient malnutrition and ob overweight and obesity, it seems to me that part of the multi-sectoral thing is actually sort of the psychosocial aspects of this and how we take that into account without being overly, overly Western in our views and kind of thinking about how, how in the food environment there are nudges and triggers to move those social choices and psychological choices closer to the outcome of, of better health. So um, I had to say that we have less than five minutes to wrap this up, so we'll take one last question, and then please uh, make your answers brief. Hey, my name is Omar Dari from the Bureau for Global Health of USAID. Uh, thank you for the presentations. I would like to ask you directly a question, Derek. You mentioned that relative price change in my mind, that could work in rich countries. But what is happening in very poor countries where dairy money is not sufficient for doing some services? And my question is related to the last of our uh, presenters. Uh, what are the drivers of food choice? What are the drivers of consumption behavior? In all our pattern of thinking, we think we are under control. But we have not really looking at the human being how the human being behaves. And we are jumping into actions without knowing them. Yesterday in our meeting about the anthropology, what is really the drivers? In poor countries, it's not true that the uh, some uh, soft drinks are less expensive than the eggs. It's at the same price with the people going to the soft drinks. And if we take out the foods, they can buy times in the cell phone better than foods. I mean, this is more complex that we are thinking in this. So I have one more challenge for the panel, which is, you see, we have three minutes left. <laughs> so please try to uh, stick to that time. Thank you, if possible. And then we can always continue the conversation one-on-one -on -one after the seminar ends in an informal way. Okay, um, on the right to food, um, I, yeah, we really wanted to emphasize that sitting as a, a, a UN report um, and going beyond just the idea of equity, but social justice, so where we have the idea of lifting everyone to, to the level that we want to see our world in. And it's not just the undernutrition side, it's also the overnutrition side. And we really debated, we wanted to add healthy in front of the right to food, but we weren't allowed to change that. Um, but we, there, the idea is not keeping people alive, it's letting them thrive. And that's the right that everyone should have. And you get quickly into ethical debates on that, but, um, we really wanted to emphasize a, a, a social justice approach more than just an equity or an equality approach. On the trade, no, we didn't debate it enough. And it was an area that I was uncertain. Eileen and I talked a lot about it. And I'm actually on a Lancet commission on planetary boundaries. And uh, that's led by Walter Willett and Johan Rockström. And we've been debating the trade issue. And it's such a sticky issue. Um, so I very much take your point. Um, 
the Pacific Island examples are always used as the trade examples. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and your idea of consumption policies is a very important one, and thank you for that, for that uh, comment, that really constructive comment. But the trade one is a, is a big deal. On food environment, a couple of people have talked about this. I completely agree. We know what drives consumer choices and decisions. It's taste, cost, and convenience. Health and environment are way down the list. I work a lot in Nepal. Dalbat takes a long time to cook in the morning. I'm sure you've all had dalbat, the rice and lentils. And more and more women are moving to the instant noodles. Why? Because they're really tasty. I think they are. They're, <laughs> and they're not great for you. But, and they're really cheap and they're really easy to make. And so how do we, knowing those three things, how do we change healthy foods and the environment, knowing those three things, that th those are the big drivers, um, with taste often being number one. And, and, and food industry knows that. You know, they've done a lot of surveys looking at what drives consumer choices. We don't see that data because it's proprietary information, but they understand it deeply, much more than we as academic researchers do. Um, there's a lot of data out there on what drives consumer decision making. It's just how do we then take that data and use it to to impact healthier food environments? Eleven seconds. I agree on trade, and I would suggest people read the report out of FAO that came out in early uh, 2017, which is a much more thorough review. Uh, I'm not one to argue from a sample size of one, which would have been the South Pacific. So the, there are lots of positives with trade. And let me just say that uh, normally we think about change at the political level as incremental change. But if you look at where there's been draconian changes, 60s, women's movement, civil rights movement, anti-Vietnam War, you need to mobilize the community. Okay, please join me in thanking uh, the uh, panel. Thank you very much. I, I invite you to come and continue the discussion with them. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming here. And to those online, thank you for attending. Thank you very much.